Hello, my name is Janelle Hager. I am a research associate here at Kentucky State University specializing in aquaponics. And today we're going to do an overview of aquaponics and how um, that differs from recirculating aquaculture, how it's the same, and how it can be utilized in your classroom. So what is aquaponics? Aquaponics is the integration of recirculating aquaculture and hydroponics. But it's actually a lot more than this. So recirculate, recirculating aquaculture is um, really intensive aquaculture production. We really want to maximize our water use, um, and therefore we have to add a few things that you know, might differ from the way we typically think of aquaculture production in ponds or in semi-intensive environments. So um, one of the main reasons why aquaponics is so popular is, and how it really came about is the need to kind of deal with this solid waste accumulation that um, occurs in intensive aquaculture production. So kind of took, taking cues from hydroponics, which is growing plants um, without soil, so in water or some sort of substrate, these plants prefer this really nitrogen-rich water that is found in our recirculating systems. So putting the two together has been really beneficial as far as um, conserving water resources and um, kind of eliminating the waste problem that we see in uh, intensive aquaculture. But really it's not just the combination of aquaculture and hydroponics. It is what we're really trying to do is create an ecosystem um, that balances out all these systems. So they say we grow three things in aquaponics, which is fish, plants, and bacteria. So what are some of the benefits we see in aquaponics? We use approximately 80 to 90 percent less water than soil-based agriculture. In intensive recirculating aquaculture, we find um, those are characterized by 10 percent or less water exchange per day. Oftentimes in aquaponics, we see 1 to 3 percent water exchange per day, and even less than that in some cases where um, the water is mineralized, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. In addition, plants have faster growth rates than in uh, soil-based agriculture and a 75% smaller footprint. So that means that there's less space required per plant, which makes these systems really efficient as far as growing a large amount of crops on a very small space. We can also utilize vertical space in a greenhouse or in an indoor production facility. We also have ra their beds are raised off the ground, and what that does it eliminates any pathogens we typically associate with soil. Um, there's no weeding, which is good for gardeners, <laughs> and um, there's also a lot easier on the workers. They don't have to bend over. The rafts or the um, aquaponic systems themselves can be built up to the waste level, so that kind of is a little bit easier on physical labor. We can have year-round production in um, tropical environments, but also um, as we move up into temperate environments, we can have year-round production in greenhouses or indoor buildings. And it also works in places that we don't typically think we can grow crops, such as places with poor soil quality or places that are affected by drought where water is really limited. Um, some of the challenges we see are um, it's really difficult to treat any issues with the fish or plants that come up. So you can't use any pesticides or herbicides or anything like that on the plants because it's um, toxic to our fish. And also, um, a lot of the fish treatments we use, or fish disease treatments we use, such as salt or copper sulfate, are toxic to the plants. So this means that it's a little bit harder to manage overall, but it also lends itself to a more sustainable production and really, in the eyes of the consumer, um, makes it kind of a better way to produce and then you know, eventually, ultimately eat the food. So with aquaponic systems, they, it becomes a little bit more complicated. You have to have an increased knowledge of both fish and plants, and you have different harvesting schedules. So your fish cycle is going really slow, so you're not really harvesting um, a lot of fish, maybe only three or four times per year. And, but your plants are going really, really quickly. So those you get every three weeks, every week, if you, depending on how you manage your system. Um, the initial setup cost for aquaponics is pretty high. There's a lot of components that you need. Um, there's not tons of really great models for success, but over the past five years, that's really changing. And um, lack of experienced workers. Um, you really have to know a lot about a lot of different components when you're looking at aquaponics. You have to be a plumber, a construction worker, an aquaculturist, 
a you know, plant person, you have to have both a green thumb and a blue thumb for, for this kind of work. So aquaponic systems, almost all of them follow the same order of operations. <coughs> um, we'll go through these in a little more detail. Um, we have a fish tank, um, generally some sort of solids removal, um, some sort of biological filter. Um, you have your hydroponic subsystem and also a sump pump where your water is collected and then returns back into the fish tank. This is a recirculating system, so the water moves through each of these components, is treated in some way, and then recirculates back for reuse. So going through some of these different um, aspects of your aquaponic systems, um, water is continuously pumped um, from a reservoir or sump tank into these fish rearing tanks. You can see here that there's a lot of different designs for fish tanks, so um, you can really use a wide variety of things. Um, one thing that you'll see with a lot of fish tanks that you buy that are specifically for um, aquaculture or fish culture is that they're round. And one of the reasons that you find that is because the water will uh, move in a circle around the tank and concentrate those solids in the middle of the tank. So that just makes it really easy to flush those solids out of the system or handle them in whatever way you choose. But, you know, if you're looking for a more low-cost way to set up an aquaponic system, these um, immediate bulk containers, the white tank right there with the cage around it, um, are really cheap. You can buy those food grade um, for about $100 a piece, um, but you want to make sure that they are used only for food or they're new because um, a lot of times people will transport chemicals and things like that in there. Um, but our fish tanks are generally the highest point of the system, and we do that because gravity is free, so we want to utilize um, that as much as possible. So coming from the fish tank, we need some sort of solids filtration. Solids filtration is basically just separating um, any leftover feed, um, solid fish waste, or algae from our culture water. And it's arguably the most important aspect of aquaponic systems. So we really want to focus a lot on getting rid of these solids before they even enter into our plant beds. Um, we want to prevent them from entering the plant beds, in fact. So we want them concentrated in um, whatever solids filtration we have. So like I said, um, we have like fish waste, uneaten feed, algae, um, and bacteria biofilm that can kind of sloth off and enter into the water column. And if we don't get rid of these solids, we, it results in poor water quality conditions. Um, if they build up without being moved around, um, anaerobic bacteria will break these solids down and release harmful gas into our culture environment. And one telltale sign of that is the sulfur smell that you smell when you're um, like cleaning out an aquaculture system. And then the solids also clog our roots and prevent any uptake of nutrients um, into the actual plant. So it's really important to get these solids out of your system before they even enter into your hydroponic beds. Biofiltration, um, this is where we want to create an environment where these beneficial bacteria can grow and convert any toxic ammonia products into a non-toxic form that our plants take up called nitrate. Some of the main criteria of these biofilter systems are a large surface area for bacteria to grow on and also lots of heavy aeration. Um, you need a pretty good flow rate through here to pre prevent any um, solids from kind of settling on the bottom of your tank. But these can be made out of really low cost materials. You can see dish scrubbies, um, the blue bio balls are often used in aquaculture. Um, that bottom picture there is called Miss Media. It looks like a wagon wheel and it just is, has a really high surface area and a really small space for our, uh, our beneficial bacteria to grow. Um, you can also see that just a tank with some orchard netting in it, um, just a fine mesh can also be very beneficial in providing that surface space for those bacteria to grow on. Mineralization. This is something that's taken directly from wastewater treatment. Um, basically, it's decomposition of solids by bacteria. And what it does is it converts that organic solids, um, which is your, generally your, your fish waste or your feed, leftover feed, um, into an inorganic nutrient is what plants can take up. So a lot of our um, phosphorus and things like that are trapped in those solids that we have concentrated in our solids filtration area. And so a lot of our nutrients that in our fish feed really get trapped in those solids. So what we want to do is break those down and then re-release them back into the system um, so our plants can um, have access to all of those nutrients. 
And so what this mineralization process does is it breaks down, it reduces the amount of supplementation required in our system. So it can release things like calcium, potassium, phosphorus, um, magnesium, zinc, iron back into our system water so we don't have to supplement those nutrients um, into our system. In addition, um, bacteria that break down these solids are antagonistic to plant root pathogens. So that kind of, they help to create a healthier environment for our plant roots in the system. So how do you set up a mineralization tank? Um, basically what we do here at KSU is we just have a IBC or intermediate bulk container um, that we have. It's an offline system. So we discharge our solids into like a five gallon bucket, um, dump them into our IBC tote, and then just have heavy aeration. So we have an air compressor or air blower with a, a stone, air stone in there, and it's just churning up that water, heavily aerating it for our bacteria, and breaking down those solids into finer pieces. Then after about a week, we will turn the air off, let all those solids settle to the bottom, and um, then release all of that um, cleaned or you know, more clean, nutrient-rich water back into our aquaculture system, um, into the plant beds so they can take up all those, those nutrients. The hydroponic component, um, one thing you'll notice about these pictures is that the majority of your system footprint is going to be your plant. So in the back there under that cover is all of the fish tank and solids filtration and stuff like that. And then they have about 100 feet of plant beds of, um, that they can use to take up all those nutrients produced by the fish. So your primary crop is going to be um, plants in an aquaponic system. The sump tank um, is generally the lowest point of the system. Um, this is where we do any base additions like calcium, potassium, and iron to the system. Water collects here and is then pumped back into the fish tank. And um, this separate tank prevents the water level in the fish tank from decreasing. So, you know, water is collected here. So if something happens and your pump goes dry or, your, I mean, your sump goes dry, um, your fish are protected because they're not living in this fish tank that's, um, that's lower in the ground. So there's three main types of systems that we will discuss today. The first is deep water culture or raft-based aquaponics. The second is a flood and drain or media-based system. And a nutrient film technique is, an, is the third thing we'll discuss. And these are all taken directly from the hydroponics industry. Um, deep water culture systems, um, there's, these basically have the exact same order of operations um, across the board. So you see here from what we were just talking about, we have our fish tank a clarifier, which is a solids capture tank, a mineralization tank where we have a, or biofilter tank. Um, that's where we have your orchard netting or all of that increased surface area for bacteria to grow on. Um, you generally have two or multiples of two with your hydroponic system, so the water will flow down one tank, um, back up the other, and exit out into your sump tank. The sump will then pump your water back into the fish tank. Uh, this big surface area that you'll see all those plants are taking all the nitrogen, all those nutrients out of your water, and essentially cleaning it to be recirculated back into your fish tank. So here you can see these are just um, rafts or polystyrene rafts. You can use a number of different things in these systems. But the roots just dangle down into the water and are provided with constant access to nutrient-rich water. So some of the pros and cons of deep water culture, there's a large water volume. And what that does is it resists changes in temperature um, and pH. Um, there's a long history of research in these systems, 25 plus years um, in Canada, the University of the Virgin Islands, um, Virginia Tech. There's all kinds of um, university and commercial based systems that have researched these and come up with kind of best protocols. Um, these systems have faster growth rates in plants because the oxygen is provided to the water, nutrient rich water again. And you know, they also are popular because they have easier harvesting mechanisms and transplanting than, than other types that we'll talk about. Sometimes you won't see a dedicated biofilter in aquaponic systems. Um, and that's because these types of systems, especially deep water culture, provide a big surface area for all of that bacteria to grow on. And what I mean by that is basically any surface on the tank that is underwater, whether that be in your hydroponic bed and your fish tanks, really anywhere um, that bacteria is growing. So what are the cons of these systems? They're more complex to build. Um, there's a lot more parts. You have more tanks, more air stones, 
more kind of water flow management stuff going on. Um, that makes it a little bit more expensive as well. Um, you have to wa monitor the water quality more frequently. And, and you also have to add bases to buffer the pH that's dropping constantly in your system. For a larger commercial style environment, um, maybe kind of a high tunnel design if you're looking to, to sell some of these crops, this is generally the type of culture system that we recommend. But if you're looking at doing something about, you know, in a classroom environment, really the, the media-based systems might be better for you, and we'll talk about that next. Um, just quickly, this slide is, looks over the University of Virgin Islands system. Um, this has been replicated all throughout the world and has been very successful. Um, and so you can kind of take this if you're interested in scaling it down. Um, it gives you all of the dimensions and everything that you need right there. So flood and drain systems, like I said, are primarily used for backyard or school-based systems. Um, they can come in a variety of different forms. And as you can see from a couple of these pictures, that you can use really a wide variety of materials to make these systems as well. Basically what happens is the water um, from the fish tank pumps up into a bed that is full of a substrate. Generally it's some sort of media or rock. And the, the water fills up really, really slowly in that system and the, um, fills up the bed and then drains really quickly out using a, a siphon or a timer-based system. So what this does is during that quick drain mechanism, it pulls oxygen down into that substrate and provides oxygen to our roots, which um, improves plant growth. So um, we'll, we'll talk about maybe some different types of designs here in a second, but let's look at what we actually use for our substrate. So the media is, you can use pea gravel, lava rock, um, really common, it's expanded shale or expanded clay pebbles. Um, Really what you're looking for in any kind of media is, like kind of with our biofilter, really porous, inert material that can hold water and hold oxygen during those cycles where the, it's not flooded with water. In these type of systems, the, the media actually take the place of the solids filter and the biological filter in the system. So what are some pros and cons? Um, they're really simple to construct. You can you do it with two tanks. You can add a series of tanks together. Um, there's less parts um, as the media bed acts as your filtration components. So that's kind of a good thing because it's a little bit less expensive <coughs> than a raft-based system. Um, they're easy to manage. You don't have to adjust for water quality as much as you would in a larger um, deep water culture system. Um, there's less water volume as well to kind of manage and whether you're in a backyard or classroom environment. And flowering plants or fruiting plants like tomatoes and cucumbers do really well in these systems. So what are the cons? Um, the media can be very expensive. Generally, even just for a small classroom size system, you're looking at spending at least a couple hundred dollars on, on the media to get something that is really works in your system. Um, like I said, you, if you, when you're purchasing media, you don't want to buy anything that can impart any negative qualities into your water. Like, you know, here in Kentucky we have um, limestone, so that can be really difficult if you wanted to use pea gravel because a lot of that is comes from um, this area and it can negatively impact your water, water quality in certain ways. Um, these systems have found to be less productive than other types of aquaponic systems. You can't really plant your um, plants that close together and it doesn't have a constant access of nutrient-rich water like we see in deep water culture. So the roots really need to like anchor down in that media and kind of spread out in order to, to take up um, those nutrients that are provided by our fish water. They're pretty hard to clean. There's root fragments that are left over when you harvest your plants. Um, all of your solids can accumulate up in there and kind of you know sit there and not really get mixed around very well, which can lead to poor water quality issues. Um, so every year, as you kind of shut your system down, if you're outside or in a classroom, you really want to clean those solids out pretty well um, so you can run your system more effectively the next year. So there's a couple different designs for these systems. Um, they're really basic. There's also lots of resources on the internet that are step-by-step -step instructions on how to build um, these systems that you see right here. Um, the water is pumped directly up from the fish tank and floods that bed. So you can see on the the image, it's just a big loop that goes around there. 
on, on the other image on your, on your right, you see that the fish tank is actually um, separate. So, you, so it's basically an addition of a, a fish tank on there. And we talked a little bit um, earlier about that buffer of water. And what that does is if something in your pump malfunctions or you didn't fill your sump tank up, um, your fish are protected in that system. On the, in the image on the left, if your pump or your, or your siphon or your timer doesn't go off, they can actually pump all that water out of the tank and leave your fish really vulnerable. It's actually happened before, so I, I don't recommend it. Um, the third type is nutrient film technique. This is basically where you have a sump or a fish tank, and the water is pumped from that, that tank into a, it looks like a gutter or a, a really shallow trough system. It's just a really thin film of water that is running down that trough, and the plant roots actually grow down into that small stream of water. This is a really great type of system. It comes directly from the hydroponic industry. There's just some slight modifications that we've um, adapted for aquaponics. Our pipe diameters are a little bit bigger, and that's kind of, if you have any solids in there, like your solids filtration isn't um, working very efficiently, um, if you have a really small tube, that, those solids will clog the tube. So if you buy a kit like this um, from like farm tech or whoever you're going to get it from, um, you just want to make sure that you adapt that tubing to be a little bit bigger um, so it doesn't clog up with any fish solids. But you can see here that you can make these out of um, prefabbed uh, you know, systems. You can make them out of rain gutters, PVC pipes. There's a lot of different ways that you can do this. And you can also utilize a lot of vertical space in your, your greenhouse or your classroom, however you're, you're, you're growing these plants. So what are the pros and cons? Um, these are commonly built to waist height, which is good for harvesting and tr transplanting. Um, there's a lot of research from the hydroponics industry. Like I said, they can be made using cheap materials. And your roots have constant access to water and air and nutrients. We also see really high yields out of these systems. Um, some of the cons are it requires a separate biofilter, um, pretty efficient solids filtration. We don't see um, as much surface area for our beneficial bacteria to grow. Um, and so we really need to provide that space for our ammonia to be converted over into nitrate. In addition, nutrients build up in the system more quickly since there is a lot less water that's running through there. Um, plants are really vulnerable in the case of a pump malfunction. So you really only have a, an hour, a couple hours to um, catch that if your pump goes off because without that pump running, you don't have any um, water on your roots at all. Like I said, small parts and tubing can become clogged. And additionally, um, it kind of limits the, the t variety of plants that you can grow in these systems. So a, a lettuce plant has a pretty small root system, so we don't really worry about that too much. But if you wanted to grow something bigger like kale or Swiss chard or even a fruiting crop, it might not be great as um, the roots can clog these really thin, narrow channels and uh, prevent the water from flowing properly. Okay, so sizing your system. Um, the University of the Virgin Islands, so the deep water culture system, has a 7.3 to 1 ratio of total plant surface area, so that's in square feet, to fish tank surface area, which is in square feet. Um, you'll see that these numbers are in um, surface area and not cubic space or gallons that we typically deal with when we're looking at aquaculture. So addition, the feed that you feed per day is based on that plant um, surface area. So for leafy crops, it's 40 to 50 grams of feed per meter square per day and 50 to 80 grams of feed per square meter per day um, for fruiting crops. In these systems, we remove solids one to two times per day, and our biofilter or mineralization tank is cleaned every three to five days, depending on our loading rate with fish. For a flood and drain system, um, it kind of goes back over into our cubic calculations. Um, it's one cubic foot of fish tank to two cubic feet of plant bed space. Um, we have a maximum stocking density with our fish of three quarters of a pound of fish per gallon. So they're stocked a little bit less. You can increase that a little bit if you have really efficient solids filtration. But if you have too many solids going into your plant beds, you are going to run into trouble. 
Um, since we don't have as much water in the system, our feeding rate is about 25% less than in a deep water or raft aquaponic system. So quickly, just to go over some of our major water quality um, considerations, a lot of these will be um, very similar to what you will look at in intensive recirculating aquaculture, but there are just a few differences since we have our um, plants in there, so I'll just go over a few of these. This is from the FAO's um, Small Scale Aquaponics Manual. It's a really, really great resource, um, lots of comprehensive information about aquaculture and aquaponics, really. And it also um, has a really great section on water quality that I would highly recommend you reading before you even set up your aquaponics system. Um, but one thing you'll, you'll see here is the, the big difference that we see between fish and plants is the pH. And um, fish really like their pH to be a little bit higher, more alkaline, so they like it to be around seven to eight and a half. And the plants like it a little bit lower. They're in the, the five and a half to six and a half range, um, although certain plants and fish do have different tolerances for these things. So that's where we find our biggest difference. The one thing you want to keep in mind when you're looking at aquaponic systems is that neither of our fish or our plants are really running at their optimum ranges. And so what we see on this bottom line here is a optimal range for aquaponics. It's really a, co a compromise between a lot of these parameters. Um, not to say that if your aquaponic systems aren't running exactly on these that they're not going to be fine, but um, this just kind of gives you a target um, to, to hit when you're looking at your water quality in aquaponics. I think the most important thing about any of these water quality parameters is just don't change it too quickly. A lot of these plant species and bacteria can adapt to higher or lower conditions, but when you switch it on them really quickly, that's when there seems to be the most problem. Um, dissolved oxygen. So this is a really important aspect for almost all biological processes, whether you're talking about fish, plants, or bacteria. Fish obviously need oxygen for respiration, and it's a passive process with fish. So they're getting all of their oxygen that they need directly from the water. And water actually has a really low concentration of oxygen in it compared to atmospheric um, you know, conditions like in the air. So um, we have to provide all the oxygen they need in, in the system. Um, plants absorb uh, a lot of their oxygen um, via the roots. They also respirate when they're leaves too, but the conditions around the root system seem to be really important to maintain at a consistent level. Deficiency causes um, decreased root respiration, and that really affects how nutrients are taken up and water is taken up in the plants. Um, bacteria, is a, that conversion of ammonia to nitrate is a aerobic process, so we need at least three moles of oxygen to convert every mole of ammonia to nitrate. nitrate excuse me. So we need a lot of oxygen for our bacteria to be happy in the system. pH is also really important pH is a measure of how acidic or basic um, a solution is. Um, so the more free hydrogen ions in the water means it's more acidic. And nitrification, so that conversion of ammonia to nitrate, is produces a lot of hydrogen ions. And so that's constantly driving our pH down. So we, we adjust for that, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But one thing, I always thought this was a really great example of pH. So if you have a pH of 7 um, and then Two weeks later, you measure your pH at 5. The problem is 100 times worse, not 2 times worse. So it's not a degree of, of 2 units that you're doing it off. It's a logarithmic scale. So we're actually multiplying that out um, to 100 times worse when there's a 2 degree difference. So when you're changing your pH or adjusting for these things, that's really important to take into consideration. In addition, pH can really affect our plants. So you can see this right here. Across the top is the different pH numbers. And then on, like in the graph here is how strongly or how available those nutrients are to the plants um, depending on the pH. So you can see on that six range, six to seven range, a lot of our plants can be taken up very well at, um, I'm sorry, a lot of our nutrients can be taken up very well by the plants. But once it gets into higher pHs, it really is 
variable, especially for our micronutrients like iron um, and zinc and those types of processes, and nitrogen. In our bacteria, um, they're really flexible, but below six, it re reduces their ability to convert um, ammonia to nitrate. So they're not as effective if you really go below six. Um, just a couple other considerations when it comes to pH. As your pH gets higher, you have a larger proportion of toxic ammonia products in your system. So at, at lower pHs, you have it's a little bit more buffer there. But at higher pHs and higher temperatures, you can really run into a lot of problems with your, um, your, your toxic ammonia. So we generally bring up our pH or regulate our pH using carbonates or hydroxides. So that's calcium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide, or carbonates. Those are readily available. Calcium carbonate is, or calcium hydroxide is basically agricultural lime. So you can buy that a lot at a lot of um, farm stores. And um, we manage our pH differently in different types of aquaponic systems. Um, in our um, raft or deep water culture systems, um, we really have to be on top of monitoring all of these water quality parameters, particularly pH, so we can base our system. In flood and drain systems, um, those solids in there kind of break down and kind of add a little buffer in there. So our P we don't see the pH drop as much in flood and drain systems as we do in deep water culture. Um, temperature, fish are peculothermic, which basically just means that they um, do not have the ability to regulate their body temperature. So that means that whatever temperature our water is, that's what the temperature of the fish will be, their body temperature. And that really regulates their metabolism. So how, if your fish aren't eating and it's really cold outside, that's probably why. Or the water temperature is cold, that's probably why. And along that line, water temperature in aquaponics is... Uh, more important than the actual air temperature. Uh, temperature can affect dissolved oxygen levels, um, the toxicity of ammonia, and uptake of nutrients, so calcium is restricted at high temperatures, and additionally plant production. So if um, cool weather crops like spinach and lettuce will actually flower or bolt at higher temperatures, and what that does is it imparts a really bitter taste into those crops, and they might not really be you know, well accepted by consumers. Um, nitrogenous waste, basically nitrogen enters your system as fish feed or crude protein. Um, some of that protein is utilized for growth and the rest is excreted as ammonia through the gills and urea. Solid waste also contributes to this total ammonia nitrogen level. And the basic order of operations is ammonia um, is converted to nitrite and then to nitrate. Plants can take up all forms of these nitrogen compounds, but it's most available in the form of nitrate. So that's what they can take up the easiest. Ammonia and nitrite are really toxic to fish, um, 100 times more than nitrate. So really, you want to balance your system so you have low ammonia and nitrite levels, and you get a little bit more flexibility with nitrate. Um, so what are the ideal levels? You can see from the gra graph before was um, under one is really kind of your target. How do you correct high levels of these compounds? The best thing you can do is stop feeding. Um, people love to feed animals, especially fish, because they're fun. They splash at the surface. But they can really withstand a few days, even a week, without f being fed or minimal feeding. After that, they kind of may have some health issues. Um, they, it reduces their uh, resistance to, to disease and stuff like that. But the best thing you can do for poor water quality is to stop or reduce feeding. Um, do water exchanges with dechlorinated water. Increase your biofiltration, so increase the number of bacteria that are in there. Um, and make sure that your water quality parameters are at the level um, required by the fish, the plants, and the bacteria. And if you're finding that your nitrate levels are really high, that means your system can handle a few more plants. If everything is zero, your ammonia, your nitrite, your nitrates are at zero, that means your system can handle more fish or feed, um, or you can reduce the number of plants in your system, especially if your nitrate levels are zero. If you are trying to correct your water quality conditions with chemicals, you're doing it wrong. This is not the way that um, I would recommend to move forward in both aquaculture and aquaponics. 
Um, these are balanced systems. So if you're finding that your water quality parameters are constantly changing or are constantly high or constantly low, um, by using chemicals, you're not addressing the problem that's causing these. So um, we really want to try to move away from doing this kind of stuff and use our system management as a way to um, make sure these levels are at the adequate and optimal numbers. Um, alkalinity, this is something that you will um, gain from adding those carbonates and hydroxides into your system when you adjust for pH. And basically having a higher alkalinity means that your water um, can withstand less changes or fluctuations in pH. So in aquaculture, one of the main differences that we see between aquaculture and aquaponics is in aquaculture we use baking soda or sodium bicarbonate to raise our pH. In aquaponics, we can't use that sodium compounds because our plants won't tolerate it. So um, we use, like I said, calcium or potassium hydroxide or um, carbonate. I wouldn't be overly concerned about your alkalinity levels as long as you're adjusting appropriately for your pH. I don't really see a lot of issues. Um, in recirculating aquaculture systems, they say the alkalinity needs to be 100 milligrams per liter. Um, typically, our aquaponic systems here at KSU run around, you know, anywhere from 25 to 50 is kind of our normal number. Um, I don't really worry about it too much as um, we're adding these um, carbonates and hydroxides in low enough doses every day that it doesn't seem to be an issue with our um, bacteria. So just a few more considerations that are you might not have had in, in your previous series of lectures. Our plant growth requires 16 essential nutrients. Um, those are divided into macronutrients and micronutrients. Um, macronutrients are required in large quantities. And some of these are um, provided by the water and, and some of its components like CO2. Um, others need to be absorbed via the water or provided in the fish feed. Um, and then sometimes we, there's not sufficient levels of calcium, potassium, or iron in our fish feed to support plant growth. And that's why we supplement those when we adjust our pH. One thing you should be aware of is that having too much of any of these nutrients can actually limit the uptake and availability to the plants of another one. So for example, potassium excess prevents the uptake of calcium in your system. So you might see those calcium deficiencies um, show up, and that might be a result of your water quality conditions, or it could be a result of having too much of one nutrient in your system. I think we just went over this. So tip, what you can do with, if you're kind of worried about your plant nutrients is have your plants tested, but you can also just kind of pay attention to the signs they're giving you. If they're deficient in any nutrient, they're going to show you. One thing to note here is with the iron, we want to add chelated iron um, and keep that at around two milligrams per liter. I would recommend having a DTPA iron. You can get that in seven to 10%. Um, and the reason why we recommend using that is that it's very stable at a pH of seven. So it's really bioavailable available to your plants and it also stays in your in solution in your water for a lot longer. Um, that link at the bottom is a great video that you can look at on YouTube, and it tells you how to calculate how much iron to put in your system. I would strongly recommend um, looking at that group, Bright Agrotech. They have a lot of really great aquaponic videos on YouTube. Some of these nutrient um, deficiencies will kind of manifest in different ways. Um, nitrogen, which we don't really think of as a problem in aquaponics, um, as long as your fish have, are stocked at the correct level. Um, but some of the issues you see are yellowing of the, the, the whole leaf. Um, that's a process called chlorosis. Um, and it, the whole plant will actually become yellow after prolonged nitrogen stress. Another is phosphorus. If you're um, focusing on fruiting plants in your system, um, you'll probably have these issues unless your fish stocking densities are pretty high. Um, the leaves appear dull, dark green, kind of blue, red, or purple. That red-purple color is a really telltale characteristic sign of phosphorus deficiencies. In addition, if you're having any like fruiting crops, you'll see um, your flowers will just kind of like crinkle up and they won't even um, bloom or fruit. So that's another way you can tell of a phosphorus deficiency. Um, but if you have excess phosphorus in your system, it can interfere with the uptake of calcium, um, copper, iron, and zinc. 
potassium deficiency. Again, we don't see this too often, especially with uh, growing leafy greens, but it does happen in fruiting crops. Um, we see like necrotic spots or kind of burned or brown, burned looking or brown spots on the plant. Um, in addition, if you see growth or dieback, um, it might be a sign of potassium deficiency. And they appear first on recently matured leaves. Um, calcium, this is really common in a lot of fruiting crops as well. Um, you'll see that end blossom rot. It might just start as a spot, but then it really develops into a big um, spot, especially on the bottom of tomatoes. It's a really big issue. Um, calcium deficiency can also manifest as um, this crinkling of the leaves. It looks like someone just scrunched them up, almost like they're dehydrated. We see that a lot in tomatoes grown in deep water culture and um, basil as well if your calcium levels aren't um, adequate for their growth. Iron is really characteristic as well. It's that distinct yellow or white areas will appear between the leaves with the veins um, remaining green. Um, we see that a lot on newer leaves and it's kind of rare on more mature leaves. But if you if you're dosed your system with iron, which is one of our limiting nutrients, um, if you dose too much of it, it can really um, reduce phosphorus uptake. So if you're growing plants and you kind of, or tomatoes, and you kind of put too much iron in your system, you might start to see a phosphorus deficiency and that yellowing or purpling of the leaves. So where do you get your water from? Um, rainwater is typically a good source for aquaponics. It has a low pH, low hardness, and almost no salinity. Um, if you're in an area that's affected by acid rain, that's this consideration that you need to take into account. And also, if you need to do a large water exchange, it might not be possible collecting rainwater. So sometimes it's nice to have that dechlorination system set up or some sort of water dechlorinator in case you have to do a large water exchange. Um, cistern or aquifer water um, quality is a concern, so you need to get that tested. Um, if it runs through limestone, water can be really hard. That's typically not an issue because our nitrifying bacteria consume alkalinity, so that's actually kind of good for um, our water quality. But you can run into issues if you have high alkalinity and low nitrification rates. Um, in addition, capacity for pumping needs to be checked, so that's basically how much water you can take out of the aquifer, and if that matches up with your um, needed production. I would recommend municipal water. Um, it's a safe water source, pathogen free. Chlorine in our tap water is really good for us from a health and safety perspective, but it's kind of bad because it's toxic to both fish and plants and bacteria. So that chlorine needs to be removed before you can use it in your system. One thing that we find in our city water, and especially um, the further away we get from the city, is added chloramines in the system. They're really stable components. They're actually bound with ammonia to remain stable. Um, but they require uh, chemical dissipation, so something to put in the water, or um, through charcoal filters. A lot of times what you can do is just have a separate tank in your greenhouse or in your classroom and put an air stone in there and just let it run for 72 hours, and, and a lot of that chlorine will, will dissipate into the environment. So you don't have to use chemicals if you don't want to. If you just have a space where you can put um, some water that can be exchanged, that would be just fine too. You just want to make sure it sits for at least 72 hours before you use it in your system. Surface water is not a good option. Um, it has pathogens, algae, snails, um, things that can make our fish and our plants um, sick. So I would stay away from surface water. Just some other minor considerations before we wrap up. Um, flow rate is really um, important to maintain good water quality. Um, if you move if your water is moving too fast in your system, if solids can get pushed through into your plant bed, for example. Um, if it's moving too slow, then solids can accumulate in the pipes or bottom of your tanks. So appropriate flow rates need to be maintained um, in your system. Building materials, um, a lot of people will use treated lumber. Um, if you have a greenhouse that you want to build a deep water culture trough in, and you're looking to maybe grow in soil after that, or you kind of want to leave your options open, I would not use treated lumber. Um, the chemicals will dissipate into your soil, and it would be really difficult to achieve any organic certification after that. For specifically aquaponics purposes, treated lumber is fine, um, as long as you cover it and it has no access or exposure to the water. You need to make sure you're building anything out of a UV-stable material, and if you're using a liner, make sure it's food safe. 
Um, one brand that's really good is called Durascrim Liner. It's a thin braided type of liner that is used in aquaponics all throughout the world. It's relatively cheap and really easily accessible and it comes in a variety of sizes. Another consideration is um, feed storage. So if you buy a few bags of feed and you don't really have any way to store it, you're going to run into issues. Buy a trash can, a five gallon bucket, something like that and store it in an airtight container. Um, the best if you need to buy a large quantity of feed is to store it in like a walk-in refrigerator or something like that. And that is basically if your feed is exposed to heat, then um, all your vitamins and minerals and your fats will actually oxidize in your feed and it kind of ruins the nutritional value. So it's a lot of wasted money if you don't store your feed properly. In addition, if you're in an area with high humidity, um, mold and can develop on your feed and that can make your fish sick, can often kill your fish, ruin your water quality. And um, you also want to keep it away from any insect or rodent um, infestation. Okay, so that is an overview of aquaponics. Um, I hope you enjoyed it.